always exciting to see those numbers go up. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Got a, got a couple in the waiting room. All right, thank you for attending tonight's program. My name is Sky Lavin. Welcome to a conversation with director Frances Causey about her documentary film, The Long Shadow. I hope tonight's conversation prompts, amplifies and encourages further conversations amongst all of us in the Zoom room tonight and with those in our communities and lives. The film has been available for screening this entire week and remains accessible through next Monday. Watch it, share it, thelongshadowfilm.com slash Illinois-libraries. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I wanted to give a big thank you to the many libraries that work together to make this event happen. This program was co-sponsored by 27 area libraries in order to bring this movie and conversation to you. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening. We have the film's producer and our moderator, Nick Kelso, and the director, Francis Causey. I'm just gonna let you go ahead and take it over, Nick. Thank you. Thanks so much, Guy. Thanks everyone for being here. So my name is Nick Kelso. I'm a producer and director of partnerships at Francis Causey Films. And you know, Francis and I are just so thrilled to be here in conversation with all of you and I have to start it off with giving another a big shout out to, to Sky Levon from Forest Park Public Library who really spearheaded this. They reached out and said, can we do something like this? And a big shout out to all the other libraries who then joined on. A couple of the early participants in those conversations were Carrie Berg from Oregon Public Library, uh, Arcadia McCauley from uh, LaGrange Public Library, um, and another big, big shout out to our, our Zoom tech who um, grace, graciously donated her, her, their Zoom room and the management of this entire conversation, Megan O'Keefe from the River Forest Public Library as well. So thanks to all of you for making this happen. We wouldn't be here without you, um, nor will be with our partners, um, Rain and, and Tiba, our great Illinois partners. So um, I'll give a quick backstory about the film, a quick sort of Zoom 101, and then we'll get started. So if you haven't watched the film yet, don't worry, you're still welcome. So the, the Long Shadow follows former CNN senior producer, TED contributor and Emmy award winning documentary filmmaker, Francis Causey and producer Sally Holst as they trace back their family's legacy of white privilege, placing it in the context of the history of anti-black racism in the United States that began with slavery and continues to impact our society today. Um, the film has reached over 90% of the country via PBS and also through partnerships with organizations like Target, Toyota, 
dozens of incredible nonprofits and faith-based groups and community organizations like all of these great libraries who came together here. So for us, this is where we really love this part of filmmaking where it's great to be on PBS, but our favorite part of what we do is getting to be in conversation with you in these types of dialogues. Um, the film is also streaming on Canopy, which I'm sure your library folk are familiar with. We love Canopy. Um, Amazon Prime, it's available uh, DVD and digital download on our website, as well as via an educational cool toolkit. And that's at thelongshadowfilm.com. Um, so a quick Zoom Q&A. So we're going to use the chat for questions today. So all of you will stay muted and we're going to be finding your uh, questions via the chat um, and I will make sure to keep them in order and then I will be bringing them towards Francis. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat at any time. I'll put a little mock question in there soon to get the ball rolling, but that's how we'll do this. Again, you'll stay muted, but we will be able to take your questions that way. Um, and that being said, I will introduce um, Francis Causey, a former CNN senior producer, Ted Fellow, Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker and journalist. Um, she's the director of many projects, including A Long Shadow, Is Your Story Making You Sick, and the New York Times critics pick Heist. So welcome, Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, I Thank you so much to Sky, uh, all the librarians. Uh, we, we, we love libraries. Um, and there's such a focal point in the community and, and a place where change can happen. And thank you, Megan. Uh, just thank you to everybody uh, who was involved. Um, we're, we are very, very honored um, to be here. Um, we, we, spent, we look forward to all of our Zooms, but we've really been looking forward to this one. And uh, we're at a critical juncture uh, with um, DEI and racial equity because what we are beginning to see is what I outlined in my film, uh, right? So we're beginning to see, um, unfortunately, I mean, Mr. Floyd had to give his life um, and uh, but the change, there was a lot of immediate change that started to happen. And we're kind of, we kind of have short memories uh, and, and short attention spans in our country. And so what we're starting to see is people getting um, in, in, you know, I, when I speak, I, I think I'm speaking in terms of national trends and national priorities. And we have got to keep the kind of the pressure on because we're beginning to people, you know, people possibly losing patience. And it took us over 400 years to get here. And so it's going to take a little time. Um, so we'll be talking about specific things you can do. Um, and But we're at a critical juncture, I think, because we are seeing what I say in the film is this kind of white pushback uh, to a lot of changes, positive changes that are happening for African Americans and African American communities. And um, owing, like, which is why it's so important to connect the dots of of the of the chain, you know, of the uh, the the things that happened in even in the beginning of our country, and still some of the same attitudes and actions are are state are taking place. And one of the main issues is lack of understanding, lack of uh, connecting the dots of, of really what happened to Africans in our country and later African Americans. And it's a really hard thing to believe that, you know, that this happened in our country. Less, less difficult for African Americans to believe, but a, a heavy lift sometimes to white folks like myself and others, um, because we have kind of been, we've kind of been um, marinated in our privilege for many, many generations. And so, I hope you'll ask really, really tough questions. If you don't want to put your name to them, please ask them anonymously. Um, the, the time is now uh, it, it, to really um, push, push, push for more change. And I'm, and I'm. I, chances are, I've heard your question before, so you won't stump me. But I'm okay if you try and stump me. Thanks, Francis. And yeah, well, I did want to um, reiterate that if you'd like to ask an anonymous question, which someone already has, thank you. Um, you can use the chat feature. And when you go over to the chat and it says two, it defaults to everyone. You can click on that and chat just to me, Nick Kelso. I'll receive your question. 
and no one else will see it. We'll ask it anonymously. So please, please do that. And also this Zoom is being um, transcribed live. So if you'd like to see a visual transcription of what's happening, click on the live transcript on the bottom of your screen and that will pop up. And you can also hide that too. Um, let's, well, let's jump right in, Francis. We, we do have a, 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 a good question that came in uh, anonymously. So they write, how do you feel about and deal with government people like Rick DeSantis, who has pretty much banned your film from college campuses in Florida? Right, great question. Um, so, so there's a real backstory, political backstory. And I talk a little bit about this in The Long Shadow. And I always try to make my films apolitical, right? But given the current, because I don't want to alienate fully one half of the country, you know? So I, I really try to be pragmatic, you know, stick to the facts, connect the dots, and have someone um, kind of um, come to a conclusion that they maybe wouldn't have because they have new information, right? And so, I mean, you have politicians, you have politics, unfortunately, falling along these ideological, really party lines, because there's billions and billions of dollars in the political system, right? And it's all geared towards this very, um, you know, black and white, sorry for the pun, but this kind of, you're either this way or that way. And I don't really think, I mean, we, we may be forced to kind of vote that way because we don't have any other choices. I mean, there are some other choices, but in the end, um, I don't think that's truly Americans' um, sweet spot. I honestly think there's, um, so, so people like Rick DeSantis are products of that system, right? And his party, I think, uh, is done, has, is doing now what the Democratic Party did with the Southern strategy. If you'll recall, I mean, pol politics, it, it, it's, it's as old as dirt that politicians try to kind of divide and conquer. And, and they try, so they have a base. They have fully, you know, I think in, in DeSantis's case, he's probably got fully 20, 25, 30% of Florida, maybe a little bit more that that you know if he if he tosses out this red meat then you know he's gonna he's gonna uh, stand a better chance of getting reelected the problem comes when you realize that that 20 to 30 percent or even 20 to 30 percent of americans or maybe a little bit more who who claim who are they 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 say they're not racist but maybe they really haven't looked at the privilege that their skin color has afforded them in this country, white, you know, white Americans. And so a guy like DeSantis, right, is, is really um, trying to find scapegoats. It's, it's, a, it's a dirty kind of underbelly of our political system, right? Uh, and he's trying to appeal to their worst instincts. And I think his base is worst instincts, right? Which is xenophobia and racism and, you know, the kind of stuff that took place on January 6th, right? So unfortunately, the margins are so, you know, the choices, it's, it's either or a lot of times, and, and that's um, uh, who Florida elected. Now, what I'm trying to do is reach those folks who voted for Rick DeSantis uh, and others like him who want to restrict voting uh, that have all that, that have policies that disproportionately impact people of color and disproportionately impact people uh, working people and uh, in a lot of ways and that's that's one of the reasons that I think Donald Trump was successful in that he had the old stuff but he also really was able to tap into the working class um, uh, uh, sense of insecurity right and so I, I encourage you, uh, I made a film called Heist, Who Stole the American Dream, that talks about our political system and the co-opting of the media. Uh, media became less a public service, more about um, uh, profits and corporate-owned journalism, which really explains the delivery of the news the way we get it, right? And, and so I encourage you, it's really kind of in many, many ways a sequel. Heist Who Stole the American Dream is a sequel uh, to The Long Shadow on, on a lot of different fronts. 
So we really need to get in this country, one of the core issues, and it's another film, but uh, that needs to be made is, is we have widespread political corruption. Uh, and, and as we talk about in heist, um, a very tiny number of people are influencing the laws and, and uh, you know, this huge percentage of people that want uniform elections. I mean, we had the most secure election uh, in history and, it, and we see what has happened, right? So you've got a very small number of people that are influencing and those are the people that can get meetings with their senators, with their governors. So we really need to get to where uh, a majority of the people are uh, putting pressure on uh, our politicians rather than a tiny uh, number of folks. And we talk about that in heist and it's very much a part of why we do these Zooms, right? So this is our sweet spot, right? Because we're, we're, we're on PBS, we're that kind of thing. But this is really where the grassroots bottom up change happens, right? You see this Zoom, you see the movie, you tell somebody, they tell somebody. Because, because I think like with voting, uh, you know, close to 70% of the country would like to see, see federal uh, standards for voting and not have it be left to uh, the states. Um, I, think, I think a majority of Americans, and again, I think it's upwards of 60, 70% um, really wanna see uh, tangible change uh, we need to, about, about our history with Africans and African-Americans. They, they know, and if they don't know, they, they, they are seeking uh, films like mine out. And so let's see, you know, let's, let's do it one neighbor at a time. And if people aren't conscious about their privilege, well, you know, let's just gently bring them along. Because I think, I think, I think in, you know, our country is full of good people who give back and know that the denial of the American dream, the systematic generation, the generation denial of the American dream that I outlined in my film was wrong. It is wrong. We still feel the impact of it today and we can change it. Most importantly, we can talk about that too. Absolutely. And Francis, you touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to get to a couple of questions that came in that are fairly similar. So I'll read them both out loud. Thanks everyone for your questions so far. Um, the first is, I understand the need for change. How do I go about convincing others who do not feel any change is necessary or understand even though they are working class, uh, they are still white privilege or experience or the benefactors of white privilege. So, and also, so similar, this is, th thank you for an important film. I don't understand how anyone can know the story and not feel inspired to action. Why do you think people chose and choose to ignore this history? What is their motivation? Right. So we, first of all, we have to, um, I'm writing this down so I don't remember your two part questions because I'm, 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 I'm apt to go off on a, I, I think sometimes like I write my films with subplots, you know, so, so I'm a tendency to go off uh, in another direction. But to answer your question about um, uh, working class folks and, you know, my family didn't own slaves and you even have at the majority speaker at the time, Mitch McConnell saying, you know, why should we be responsible for something that happened 150 years ago? And so this is really, really, really counterintuitive and not factual with our history, right? So for instance, one of the reasons I put, uh, what is it makes us so, so special as a country, right? It's, you know, this shining experiment on the hill. It's because of our middle class. How was our middle class built? Our middle class was built largely without the involvement of African Americans, right? And how was it built? It was built through housing and social security. Those are still the largest driver of rising from lower middle class or lower class. I, I, the word class is, you know, I struggle sometimes with that, but it's like, so what are the mechanisms? What are the, what's the three-legged stool, right? I talk about it in my film, employment, education, and housing. So social security, that was systematically because of the influence of the South. The South that said, we're not gonna vote for uh, the New Deal. The country literally collapsing. And the South says, we're not gonna vote for the New Deal, uh, which would save the country. We're, and some people may argue that, and I could argue that too, but uh, so social security and housing. 
those things were not largely widespread available to the late 50s and 60s to African Americans, right? My family benefited from uh, housing over the years. By the time the Housing Act comes along in 1968, uh, African Americans, they couldn't buy housing, houses in uh, Levittown, right? Redlining. I mean, it's, it seems so obvious to me as the nose on your face that these, these, this pocket of, of, of wealth was systematically denied. So you get to the point where you have no generational wealth transfer. You really are starting at every generation uh, over in the African-American community for the most part, right? And not to discount black excellence. And I go into that in my film, right? With Namanai Hall, and the Canadian story. That's why, I, that's why I chose to go film those stories, investigate those stories, because it shows what African-Americans, Africans and later African-Americans were able to do uh, despite all these huge odds. So, but going back to the person who, who says, well, my family didn't own slaves. Well, I'm, I'm guessing that your family got, your mother, your father, your grandfather, your grandmother got social security. That was systematically denied to the two prime black vocations of the era, sharecropping and domestic service. Okay, so maybe you didn't, you know, maybe you don't really, you know, connect the dots there. What about housing? Maybe you were able to get a beat up car to take you to uh, community college. Um, and, and the most base level is compare yourself uh, to uh, 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 an African-American mother who worries to death as her son tries to go out with his friends on a Friday night. Is the white mother as nervous as, as the black mom, right? Chances are no. Uh, then we get into all kinds of things like this, the, the, the data and the studies on this are, there's with zero question, zero doubt uh, that African-Americans have been disadvantaged. PPP money went uh, predominantly to white owned businesses because African Americans do not have great relationships with mainstream banks for a reason. They've been targeted uh, with crappy loans. Um, so that, and, and we, can, we can discuss more of that too. But the other, the second part, so why would, why would somebody choose to ignore uh, this? If, let's, let's presume if, if, um, Let's presume maybe they're exposed and they to a little bit of information, right? And they choose to look the other way because there's some, you know, I believe that an, that anti-black racism is really kind of hard. I don't know this for a fact, but if I had to do the film over again, I might have examined it. But it's it's really hardwired into the brain. You learn it from your your parents. You learn it from your grandparents. It gets passed on through the generations. And our nation's lack of resolve and will, which, which is really one of the biggest uh, quandaries to me is why have we not examined this? And, and we did with the Kerner Commission, but we didn't enforce it, right? You see this with housing today. I mean, the, how, you know, builders get tax credits for building in uh, you know, poorer neighborhoods. Um, or even, excuse me, in, in wealthier neighborhoods, but then you start to see white pushback, right? Which is exactly what we're seeing now. Uh, so, but why, so then there, then there are those that just haven't been exposed to um, uh, the, the, a correct TikTok, a correct connect the dots, or that's one of the reasons we made the film, right? I wanted to put in one sitting someplace where people could really, in 75 minutes, get our 60 minutes, for instance, on PBS, really get quickly what's happened because we were not taught this in school. So you really, really, if you want to um, understand what happened, it's very, very difficult. The reporting is getting better in the wake of Mr. Floyd's death, but you really have to work hard. So when you come up to, to find this information, and so when you come upon a brother, a mother, an aunt, somebody who, who maybe says a racial slur or says something, if you're like me, it's like you, you're like a deer in the headlights, you know, because it's like, oh my gosh, it's, it's such a, such the antithesis of my believings. And, and so my, 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 my suggestion to you would be to um, take a breath, 
think about if you don't know this person and you're in an open setting, a public setting, don't confront this person because it might be it might be physically put you in jeopardy. You know, pick your pick your moments when you want to. We have a 15 minute version of the film. Maybe somebody's open, uh, you know, to hearing it, to watching a 15 minute version. But you might just use one of these examples I've given you. For instance, Social Security, very universally uh, well thought of in our country. And you might say to that person, and it's not so much what you say, sometimes it's how you say it. So, um, you know, just say, you know, you might, you know, you might want to stop for a moment and understand that this didn't happen for African Americans, this didn't happen for African Americans. And so you, you have um, a tsunami of poverty issues that, that continually from one generation aff affl afflict the African-American community. And those, those problems are very easy to spot. They, they, they should be very, uh, they should be very obvious to folks. It's what, as a six-year-old, uh, you know, we would take the woman who, who worked for us, who was, I didn't think of her as a worker for us. I thought of her as this loving, accepting, wisdom-filled, smart human being. And, you know, we would take her to her house and her house did not look like my house. And it did, it's worse than that. And as I got older, I began to, I began to connect the dots that we actually had our own version of apartheid in this country, our own version of apartheid. Absolutely. And along these lines, for folks who are asking, how can I do this? As Francis mentioned, we do have the 15 minute version of the film. That's a great short watch. I shared the link to that in the chat. I also shared our community action guide, which is, is a short five page PDF that talks about how do I talk about this with folks? What kind of examples can I use? And it uses the film as kind of a backstory. So please, please download that and use it if you'd like to. Francis, we had a great question come in. Why have we not seen the connection between our founding fathers and their need to protect slavery that they were all involved in? Right, so, so pretty simple, right? So um, there's been a whitewashing, um, total whitewashing of our history. Uh, I could, I mean, I could have made volumes on the history that was not known to us. And so we hear a lot about Lexington and Concord and the Tea Party and, you know, all this kind of vaunted, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, assessment of what we've done. And, and America is an incredible place, don't get me wrong. But when fully a third of our population, um, or maybe not, a th I'm sorry, about, um, I think there are about 35 African Americans um, in our country. It's like, uh, it, it's, it, it, it kind of, it was, it was denied them, these same kind of things. And so why would, I mean, the hypocrisy alone, why wouldn't we address that? And, and, you know, people kind of, they're led by the nose on these things in a lot of ways. And I think it, the more and more we whitewashed it and shoved it under the rug, and the more magical thinking we had that there's no, you know, like this nonsense about the back, backlash against critical race theory. Well, critical race theory is really, I mean, first of all, there is no race, right? Biologically, white people are no different than black people. I mean, the first human beings on earth were born on the continent or, or came about on the continent of Africa, right? So race in and of itself is, is misleading. And I talk about that. Um, in terms of indigenous, right, that deserves its own film, right? But what we did, that also has been swept under the carpet. But we did form, it's a great example, right? So we did form a, a treaty um, with all of the, the nations across the United States. We, we made reparations to Japanese Americans for so wrongfully interning them during World War II, there been, there, there's been compensation uh, to Holocaust survivors. Let's ask ourselves, why, 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 why have we not done the same thing with African-Americans? And, 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 and I would say to you, it's because we still are living under the yoke of this institutional anti-Black racism and we really haven't gotten to the root of it. And I hope you'll support HR 40 
right? Which is just a commission. Even the backlash against HR 40, it's just a commission to study the impact of enslavement of human beings, which we did fully for 250 years. We only legally outlawed discrimination in 1964. It's just a commission to study it. It's not, it's not even about taking action on any compensation that we might, we, that we might uh, come to uh, as a logical, reasonable uh, conclusion. So, uh, so yeah, so um, that's my answer to that. Thank you, Francis. Um, this is an interesting question. I, I don't think one we've gotten, at least not for a while. They write in the 1960s and 1970s, celebrities really came out against the war in Vietnam and other political issues. Where are today's celebrities and why are they not coming out with songs, videos, et cetera, in mass for social issues today? Right, so you're starting to see more um, uh, PSAs and things, you know, you're starting, it started with the NBA. I mean, so there is some of that, certainly more of that than ever before. And, you know, the problem with celebrity, it's usually tied, I'm a nobody, right? <laughs> so I, I can speak freely, right? But celebrities, not a nobody, but you know what I mean? I'm not a celebrity. Uh, I don't, at least I don't think of myself as one. But, uh, uh, you know, so celebrities are usually tied to a corporation, maybe a music label, or uh, th these issues are terrible in the movie industry, right? And so, you know, it really takes that individual celebrity saying, you know, okay, apart, apart from any material commercial interest, um, I'm going to speak out. You know, and and I think that's a huge part of it. And a huge part of that is, I think, if you if you watch Heist, right, we went from uh, we went from about sixty media companies uh, in the early '90s, by the mid '90s, um, when the FCC deregulated uh, media, uh, we went to six. We went to six media companies that control everything. And that's radio, television, film, the whole kit and caboodle, right? And so you see the rise, for instance, in radio, because these are business, businesses are inherently conservative entities. I, I'm a business person, right? And, and Nick knows, you know, how we manage our films. You know, we, we have to be very careful about where we spend money. And, and I understand that. Um, but when there's a groundswell an outcry from a majority of Americans who buy those services, whether it's music, you know, downloads, whatever, uh, to say that we we want to see this change. I mean, we we were thrilled. Toyota and Target Corporation, um, you know, uh, had us on Zooms and uh, you know buy Toyotas and buy Target because they they get it. I mean, Target's had some challenging. Uh, problems on a national level, but it's like they're really changing their culture, right? So I think it's not as, um, it's not as, I mean, they, they, they need permission and they need to have clout. I think if you're a big star, you know, you can, you can come out and say these things, but that would be my, my kind of educated guess about that. Sure, and there there are a lot of younger artists who are taking that leap too, right? And as Francis said, is that leap against the record label or what folks might want them to do. So, um, absolutely. So this is an interesting question that was emailed to us before the um, conversation. I hope this person is here. And Francis, this I'm absolutely sure is the first time we've gotten this question. Um, it's about the white male. They ask, what I find amazing is the brutality and viciousness of the white male. They say it's beyond comprehension. And they ask how can this and why and how was this concealed? They even ask what is the psych psychological premise of this behavior of protecting, I guess, the white male identity for, for so many years? Well, okay, so, so I think it's, it's um, there's, there's sexism. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of isms going on in there. And, and we have this in the film, right? You talk about, um, when one group, when the group in charge and the group empowered, right? Um, I was, I was, I'm watching a film, we're making a film about PTSD in the military and I'm watching all these 
docs on um, out there. And so it's like, I mean, a huge part of a problem with the psychiatry business and, and is, is it's grounded in, um, you know, like hysteria. Women were labeled hysterical, right? Before they truly knew what was going on perhaps with hormones and menopause and things like that. And it's like, so they, there's a, they feel threatened. The, the predominant psychological uh, uh, thought is they're, they're, they're threatened by other, any group, whether it's indigenous, Latin, you know, Latinx, Latinos, um, African Americans, it's like they, they've been in power for so long and they have, uh, they, they feel threatened. And so when you're truly threatened, and I think, I think, and there are a lot of great, wonderful uh, white males and, and my producer is one of them. Uh, he, he's like, and maybe Nick, you want to, uh, you're being a white man, um, you know, you, your, your thoughts on this, I think would be really germane. But I think it's fear, fear of losing power, losing money, being threatened. Um, and, you know, it, it's actually been around a long time. Um, and it's, it's universal, right? It's not just in the United States. Um, it, it's universal, universal. So I don't know, Nick, if you want to add anything to that. Well, I think it's absolutely fear and fear of losing that power. And I will say there's a, a large nonprofit here in our community that really went into DEI work hard. I won't mention them by name, but they've been doing a lot of work. Their CEO is a white male and they've gone so deep into the work that he realized I can't be the CEO of this organization if I'm really honoring this work. So that's the level of change I think that we're starting to see, which is incredible to me to see someone step down and realize that it's time for that power shift. But it's, it's it was a great question. And I think, yeah, it's absolutely fear and fear and power and, and the, the, the money aspect, right? Um, and someone commented, you know, similar to the feminism push in in the in the seventies. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and you saw uh, a backlash against that. I mean, I remember when I was twelve or something, thinking the the big the big deal about the ERA. I'm like, well, it's just basically saying women are equal to men, you know. And and so it's just an unwinding, right? It's a reckoning. I mean, we hear we have reckoning taking place with the Me Too movement, with what with the Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and uh, it, 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 you know, in, in the indigenous, um, one of the things I love about, um, I work a lot with um, one particular indigenous um, group, a, a nation, and, you know, they just, they've been empowered, um, you know, by this, the wealth um, from uh, the casinos across Arizona, and it's just so great for them. I mean, they, they're just self-determined, right? We all know that, that, you know, when you have a little bit more money and this is what we need to recognize with the African, African-American communities, right? It really, really is about money. And because with money come, becomes self-determination. And I, this is a major point in the film and I don't know if it was subtle or obvious to some people, but it's like the right to choose the, the way you wanna live your life. Like personally, if if there was an African American who was smart and politic, you know, was a politician that was trying to be, I would be okay if they would speak abonics. You know, that was a big deal. It's like speak the way you want to speak. I'm not threatened by your cultural, you know, how you choose to live your life, what you wear, how you speak. You know, it's like let's let, but we've got to respect, right? We've got to respect, and we need to be more integrated, we need to live together, we need to break bread together, we need to realize that we are not any different. There's no way we are different except in, in access to the American dream. And, and that's, a, that's a really hard pill for people to swallow that, that as Americans, we could have done this to other Americans. And I talk about the creation of whiteness in the film, right? Which goes back to this question of white males and fear right? This is a engineered, the issue that we have uh, in the African-American community goes back to being engineered and we need to engineer our way out of it. We need to make it right, not be passive, not hope that there's magical thinking, but we need to constructively 
um, reject things like this challenge to critical race theory. That is nothing in the world, but you know, propaganda, you know, for a certain people that don't want the truth and, to, and that's gotten traction because the media, the media has, has perpetuated that nonsense, quite honestly. Francis, um, part of the reason we organized this with these 27 Illinois libraries was um, to celebrate and honor Juneteenth. So I wonder if you could talk about the complexities. I know we talked about this on, a, on one of our Zooms earlier this week, sort of the complexities behind Juneteenth and, and celebrating it and how folks on this call might learn from, from you and how you look at Juneteenth. Right. So I found myself kind of positively giddy. So, so Juneteenth giddy about it in some ways because it was a national recognition, right? Look how long it took to get MLK Day. Can't, still can't get some employers to give people MLK Day off um, and because of their own latent racism, right? But, uh, but Juneteenth, you know, it, it, it was talked about. I mean, it took two and a half, over two years to get for the news uh, that the, the slaves had been, the enslaved had been, had been emancipated by President Lincoln, right? And so I found myself, as I was in the airport with Nick coming back from a uh, shooting in California last week, I found myself thinking, should I say happy Juneteenth to African Americans, right? And so everybody's, I mean, even in the, Afri in, in the African American world, African American, I was surprised, one of the biggest surprises was hearing, I thought that this was a film just for, for white folks, right? I made the film I wanted to see and that I needed a white person to say, you know, I needed to see a film where a white person said, hey, we did this, how are we gonna fix it, right? And so even, you know, obviously in the, in the African-American community, there's different levels of understanding of the history. And I hear a lot from African-American groups who thank me for their film uh, and thank me for the film uh, that, you know, that they learned things that they didn't know. And so there, there is that problem also in the African American community. And so I didn't quite know how people would take it. Like, why would we celebrate the end of slavery? You know, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a loaded issue for, for everyone. Right. And so I wanted to recognize that that, you know, I wanted to say when I said happy Juneteenth, also happy black excellence, you know, and, and make sure that, you know, that they knew I wasn't defining them because their skin was black. I was somehow defining them uh, through this, acknowledging this holiday. Personally, um, I, you know, I just, I, I kind of wanted to see people's reaction. And, and, and I have to tell you, overwhelmingly, um, people were kind of taken back that I, me as this little white privileged white girl, you know, uh, said that, you know, I don't think they were expecting it. I don't think they, they hear a lot from people going back to the same question that the person asked about how do I talk to my family, friends, community about this when they're so resistant. It's like, I think they were, they were shocked, you know, and I've done this other times when I've seen and in terms of what we can do to support. I mean, the way I see it is we are a, we're white led allies to a black led movement. I mean, African-Americans know the answers better than I do to the problems in their community. I mean, I know them from a, a research, I mean, I'm steeped in this, like a, a good cup of tea in this issue. I've been studying it since 2013. Uh, and so, so I feel like I know a lot, but it's theoretical, right? It's like, you know, I want to, as a white ally to, the, to a black led movement, support them. And I've, I've gone up to people, uh, and, you know, one woman said support, you know, or, you know, support um, black women. And I, you know, I, I use it as a conversation starter. And those are some of the many things that we can be doing, right? We can, we can express support um, with our Congress people and our senators for HR 40. We can, we can buy at black owned businesses. Um, we can support black activists. They've got to, you know, they've got to eat, they've got to cars to, repair, they've got um, uh, rent to pay, mortgages. And so, uh, you know, let's support wherever we can um, the movement, local, state, regional, federal. And Francis, yeah, we've got a, a couple great questions coming in in, in the chat. One being, 
what sort of change have you seen or are we looking forward to in the wake of George Floyd's murder more than a year ago? Right. So, so I, so I'm a media person, right? I'm a news junkie. I'm a, you know, nonfiction filmmaker. So I, I am seeing, I, and I read, you know, seven or eight newspapers a day. I try, I get a little bit, I'm put out with the cable outlets because they're not really covering news. They're putting pundits out there and they're speculating a lot. Um, and, and they're not really out in the middle of the country understanding the disenfranchisement that white folks feel. Uh, they're disconnected from the political discourse because nobody's really understanding what's happening to working people and what a struggle it is to feed your family and keep a job and have health care and all those things. Um, and so, um, oh, so that was another diversion. What was the question, Nick? Sure, sort of what we've, what sort of changes we've seen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so I see cha huge changes in the reporting, right? Um, in, in print, radio, television, news, I see, I do a lot of um, nonprofit sources of journalism that I, I support, I support you really reaching out to outlets like ProPublica, right? And, and other, other non, non, uh, nonprofit, it's not corporate owned news. Um, and so I see a lot more reporting that I, in previous years I've seen go away and I've seen there continue to be reporting. I've, we've seen billions of dollars um, that, have, that have been directed to um, the African-American community. We've seen, when you see corporations um, start having scholarship programs, for instance, Goldman Sachs, uh, um, City Corp, they, these, they're having uh, uh, mentoring programs to, to, to make sure um, that they have uh, equity and diver you know, diversity and inclusion in their workforce. Um, so, so you see, it, and some of those might be like, oh, if, they, if they're not successful, then maybe they'll stop. And that's happened before too. This is where the bottom up grassroots pressure um, and each person on the Zoom has that power and that authority. And if you don't know it, seriously, if you don't know where to, to turn, um, you really can't think about it. You're, you know, you can't find any way in your community. Reach out to us at hello at francescausyfilms.com. I will find you five things to do other than the ones we've talked about. I will find that for you in your community. Definitely. And there's a little bit. There's all kinds of great stuff happening. And in, in Illinois, there's the Together is Better Alliance, yep. um, which I will share the link in the chat. And I don't know, Francis, do you want to talk about them oh, a little bit? Yeah, it's like I, I get this, you know, incredible warm, fuzzy feeling. So there were two African American women in 2017, who, and I can't remember exactly. They saw the film, uh, and they um, they were so moved by the film, and they form. Uh, one was a former GM corporate lawyer. The other one was an, an entrepreneur. And they formed the Together is Better Alliance. And they are they uh, show the film. They show other films. They take field trips. They have pizza together, black and white. You know, they, they're getting black and white together, which is really, really what it's about, right? Because then those, that stigma, that, that, that stereotyping, that you know, uh, scapegoating just falls away, right? They, they go to the, the museum and they've taken a trip to the museum in Montgomery, the, you know, the, um, the African-American museum there. And so, they, and, and we've had people that have formed chapters from the Chicago chapter. And that's why we're, pro I think pretty much we're sitting here tonight because the film has been shown more in Illinois than in any other state by far. So it just goes to show one leads to the next, right? It's word of mouth. And so if anybody here knows librarians in other um, states, cities, municipalities, please, because the great thing about uh, libraries is they're turnkey. They're really, they, they're already uh, established to show film as an educational tool. So it, you know, that virality, I mean, we have over 50 um, some people, you know, on, the, on this call, which is a really, really good turnout. So give yourself uh, credit. 
Absolutely. And we, you know, we saw this coming through our, our alerts. This was written up in multiple local newspapers. So, I mean, libraries are such a centerpiece. I know they are for me in my life and for Francis. And so it's just an, an, an additional honor to, to do this with, with yeah. everyone here. One um, thing one thing you can do is there's a, a woman who, I think I mentioned this um, earlier, but maybe I didn't, um, what you can do is support um, Rochelle Zola. She's a Chicago area woman who's in the 39th day of her hunger strike for the passage of HR, 7, uh, HR 40. Um, so show your support. I think she was interviewed on WGN recently, last night even. Um, you can go to our Facebook page and you know, copy, uh, you know, share those links. And I mean, talk about somebody who's putting it on the line and, and please support Rochelle. We are. Yeah, I will drop the link in the, in the chat right now. Yeah. yeah, we had a great discussion with, with Rochelle and her yeah. team last night. Um, there was a comment in the chat, uh, hopefully it will change with the children. Francis, are you, are you seeing hope with the next generation? Well, it's, you know, to be honest with you, it's hard, it's hard for me um, to gauge that because we have had a really hard time. Now, this film is not appropriate for, so, you know, for, for K through six, obviously. Uh, so we want to be careful about that. But we have been trying to get the film in, in school systems and, you know, like the medical profession, you know, do no harm. I mean, you know, they, they, they're, 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 they're very conservative. They're zealously guarding, um, you know, what, what kids get seen. And so we have, we've tried to make the film available to school systems and it's just gone, you know, you can start to get this diversity of voice and then they, they shut us down. But, but the problem is, uh, you know, the school books they're reading, a, a large percentage of them are coming out of Texas and they are recasting, they're doing just very, very, racist things like recasting uh, slavery as a state's rights issue. Um, and that is just wrong. And I, you know, I don't, I, I haven't really looked at, you know, why so many of the school textbooks come out of, uh, it seems like there's a monopoly in Texas on, on curriculum and the school books and all that. That's crazy. You know, how can we, how can we make that a more open and inclusive process? But um, and we've had a really hard time getting the film seven through um, 12, we've had a really hard time getting the film seen. We would give it, we, we would give it to whatever school system wanted it. Um, and, and we've had quite a, a difficult time with colleges too. Where we have not had problems is with libraries. Canopy is one of our biggest distribution platforms and you all know Canopy, right? Uh, and so, so, uh, you know, hopefully there's some trickle down going on. Uh, there are parents that are very active in PTA that could really make a big difference. And, you know, if your child comes home, look at what they're reading. What's their textbook saying? And, and then go to the, you know, go to the PTA, go to the uh, superintendent of the school system and say, this is wrong. This, this is factually inaccurate. Yeah, we've, we've heard some amazing stories of that happening on, on these Zooms. Um, Definitely. And Francis, this kind of leans into what we were talking about of how the film is being used in, in, other, in other ways than, than just, uh, you know, being shown theatrically or even in, in partnerships with nonprofits more. Um, uh, are you aware of any communities where there has been success engaging small and medium businesses in the fight for fairness through the film? That's a great question. Um, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, um, you know, in terms of businesses, um, I know what we're doing, um, you know, and I can cite other examples where, where that's happening. You know, like in Oregon, there was a white pushback to making PPP available to predominantly African-American business owners. You know, there was a, there was a countersuit to that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know Amania is a business person, the Together is Better Alliance, but in terms of specifically businesses, we're, you know, we're focused, you know, uh, I, I'm doing Zooms on a, 
you know, in other states and on a national level. And, um, but I'm sure, I'm sure there are. I mean, I know that we got the idea of helping to fund activists, you know, through the Black Lives Matter. I mean, so they, they, I mean, I, I would look to them and other activist groups, um, you know, uh, Surge, um, showing up for racial justice. They have a very, very robust uh, support of local black businesses. So they're, they're doing phenomenal work. I can't cite specific examples other than our own personal outreach. Sure, and you know, and we and we've seen sort of change happen with the film. For instance, when we shared the film with the Toyota Chicago region, we did one of these zooms. They said we want to do another one. We did another one. Then they said we want to do a two-hour, and we want to invite more of our partners. So they really made it a cornerstone of. And so is Target. You know, mm -hmm. they they they. So that's where the film, I mean, obviously there's a Target store in every city. There's a Toyota dealership in every. So uh, if, you, if you choose to, you know, trade with those places, tell them you saw the film and, and the filmmaker said that, you know, she did it on national Zoom, you know, with those two corporations. And so we, we just have about three or four minutes left. Francis, what do you want to leave everyone here with tonight? Um, how can folks, we've talked about using our community action guide, I can share that again in our 15 minute version of the film. Is there anything we haven't discussed that you want to leave folks with as, as we close? Well, don't throw your hands up, right? I mean, if you're on this Zoom, you, um, you obviously have an interest. To what degree you're committed, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, but um, don't throw your hands up and say, oh, this problem is so big, I can't, I, there's nothing I can do to really make a difference. That is demonstrably false. You can make a difference right after you get off the Zoom call. You can call your representative, you can call your senator, you can give your support to HR 40. There, you know, you know in your heart of hearts that they, and in your mind, that there are many, many things you can do. So try not to, to kind of get so frustrated and, and you read something and it, you know, it triggers you and, and you, you throw up your hands uh, and just do what you can. Um, just do what you can and you will begin and, and tune into also um, when you read, I, I call it reading in, you know, so I read in every morning, you know, multiple newspapers and you're not going to do it to that degree, but be looking, looking for change in action because it's happening. It's happening. We are, so, I mean, the evolution of this Zoom that we do, Nick, when you agree, has really changed demonstrably uh, in the wake of Mr. Floyd's death. Mm -hmm. So change is happening. If it's not happening in your life, don't throw your hands up and also uh, understand that you need to find change where it's happening and look for it and, and be encouraged by that. Um, because I don't, this is not, um, I do believe, and I hope I, do, I, I don't live to eat these words, but we're, there's no going back. So if, even if it's just at a spiritual, mental, emotional level, accepting that this is here to stay. And I've, I've spent, eight years working on this movie, making it, releasing it, talking about it, making media appearances about it. And I'm telling you, it's not going away. We have seen demonstrable, uh, actionable change happen in our country. And, and there's plenty you can do to make sure that that continues. Absolutely. Thank you, Francis. And thank you everyone for being here and joining us for this conversation. Now this has been recorded. So for folks who couldn't make this and wanna share it, reach out to your library or visit the screening page, the longshadowfilm.com backslash Illinois libraries to um, share it and, and watch the conversation, uh, watch the film again. Um, I'll share a link for folks who are interested in, in hosting a screening event or who work somewhere that may want to do that. Um, I just dropped that in the chat. Uh, again, thank you to Megan O'Keefe from River Forest Hi. Library for hosting this event. Thank you, Arcadia McCauley, um, Carrie Berg, and Sky Levon for being sort of the early adopters in conversation of making this happen. 
Um, thanks to you and, and everyone here, hundreds of people watched the film um, and we're so grateful for that. And thank you everyone for being here. Again, my name is Nick Kelso. I'm producer and director of partnerships at Francis Causey Films. Um, please, please, if there's a question that we didn't get to today that's on your mind, please reach out to us. You can find our contact information all over our websites or just hello at franciscauseyfilms.com. So thank you so, so much and please have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody stay safe.